scripture reading this morning will be from Zechariah 8, 1 through 8, and 20 through 23. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Zion. Yes, with great wrath I am jealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, will it also be too difficult in my sight? declares the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west, and I will bring them back, and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Thus says the Lord of hosts, It will, be, it will yet be that peoples will come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of, the, of one will go to another, saying, Let us go at once, to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts, I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entre entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Dr. Leon Tucker used to tell the story of a man who promised the Lord that he would sell one of his calves and give all the money to missions. But he didn't fulfill his pledge. He never followed through. Every time he went to church, he would hear that inner voice reminding him, the calf must be sold. Still, he did nothing about it. One Sunday, he decided to go to an outdoor meeting in the rural community where he lived. And as he approached the gathering, the people were singing an old familiar hymn. The half never, has never yet been told. Since the man's conscience was still bothering him, he misunderstood the words and thought he heard, the calf has never yet been sold. Running towards the group, he shouted, stop, flea shop singing. I know the calf must be sold. I'll do it tomorrow. You know, men make promises all the time. And a lot of those problems are, or promises are broken. A lot of times we just disregard the promises that we make for God. You know, when something happens good, then we think we can forget the promise that we made. It's like the guy that was praying desperately, the roofer, as he slid down the roof towards the edge for God to save him. And about that time, his suspenders caught on a nail. And he says, never mind, God, I've got it taken care of. It's kind of that type of a, an attitude that we have sometimes. But the one thing in life that we can be sure of, above all else, is in the promises that God makes. The promises that God makes to us are certain. We can trust them to come true. And Zechariah 8 is a recording of some wonderful promises of God. But to understand their import, we have to go back and understand the context that kind of grew out of last week's sermon. You recall the men who had returned from Babylon, were now living in Bethel, came with to Zechariah with a question about a self-imposed fast on the fifth month. They wanted to know if they should continue to keep the fast because the reason for the fast was over. They had fasted that they might go back to Jerusalem and now or to Israel and now they had been able to go back so they said should we continue to keep the fast the reason's not there anymore but God looked beyond the reason and he asked this question to them do you fast for yourselves or did you fast for me their selfishness was the crux of his question and Zechariah then preached a sermon that we discussed last week instructing them why they went into captivity and implored them not to follow in the footsteps of their fathers. But God didn't leave them on that negative note. 
Instead, he takes a little bit of time to give them a glimpse into the future of their holy city and what it would be like. To understand must of this message, we have to understand just two things. First, the historic setting of this message. And to understand, second, that it comes in response to the question about fasting. After telling them of the desolation that had come upon the land because of their disobedience, because of their sin, and by the way, I think that's one of the things we're seeing in our own land today. We're seeing God departing from our land because of the sin of the people and the sin of our leaders and trying to lead us in a way that is just immoral from the very beginning. But Zechariah promises it's not always going to be this way. There is going to be future blessings for obedience. And he tells us God is extremely jealous over Zion. Zion properly is the hill upon which the temple stood. Some tide referred to as the entire city of Jerusalem is called Zion. And God's promise to the people is that I will return to Zion and I will dwell there in their midst. You know, nations that trouble themselves over Zion today, over Jerusalem, should be afraid, desperately afraid. And that includes the United States. Those that try to say, well, Jerusalem isn't the capital of Israel. I think they need to be deathly afraid because God will give us that answer one of these days. God's presence used to dwell between the cherubims on the mercy seat. I don't know how many of you remember that, but the mercy seat was the very top of the Ark of the Covenant. There were two cherubims or angels touched overhead, and that mercy seat is where the glory of God dwelled uh, in, among the people. It was called uh, God's Shekinah glory. Dwell there on the mercy seat. But when wick people's wickedness became great, God departed from their midst. Zachar, er, uh, Ezekiel 10, 18 and 19 talk about that happening. It says, Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And when the cherubim departed, they lifted up their wings and rose up from the earth and out of my sight with the wheels beside them, and they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. What Ezekiel was seeing is the glory of God in a vision leaving Israel, departing out of, uh, out of the east gate and leaving the children of Israel behind. And the promise is now made that one day Yahweh will return and dwell in Jerusalem. You know, one of the things that it says is God is jealous over Zion. In other words, he is zealous for her honor. And the promise that he would return is a lot like the promise that Jesus made unto us when he left this earth. Uh, his promise was that he was going away. But he said, I will return. And that promise is just, just as certain as the promise that God made to Israel that he would return. It is that day when many of the promises, even like those, like the one made here, are going to be fulfilled. And that is the day that we should live for, that we should long for in our hearts, the day when Jesus Christ returns. And what Jerusalem is known for will be forever changed. He gives a description about how the people view uh, Jerusalem. In the present day, those who have come back were trying without much success to return the land from desolation. They had been in uh, captivity for years, and now they were trying to rebuild their land, but they weren't having a lot of success. Uh, to the strong nations around them, Jerusalem was looked at it with disdain. There's nothing special about this city. Uh, she was basically a city that had been destroyed and never totally rebuilt the way she had been before. 
The glory of the city had been taken away from her. But God calls her here and says she will be called a city of truth. Uh, It suggests the faithfulness to her God, that they will no longer go out after false gods. They will no longer worship power and love material things and so forth. They shouldn't be worried about just what they fasted for and then leave it. They should fast because they're wanting to draw close to God and as a sign of loyalty and love for Him. He says their faithfulness will someday be testified to by all who see her. Uh, And the idea of truth is a reoccurring theme in God's Word. Our God is a God of truth. What He says you can depend on. And he wants a people, he says, who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, He doesn't need a people who do what they want to do and act the way they want to act. He wants a people who believe what he says and acts on what he says. He says again, Mount Zion will eventually be called Holy Mountain. Jeremiah prophesied much the same in Jeremiah 31 and verse 23, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Once again they will speak this word in the land of Judea and in its cities. When I restore their fortunes, the Lord bless you, O abode of righteousness, O holy hill. No longer will Jerusalem be in that day an abomination because of what has happened in the past uh, or what is happening today. You know, I, when I was trying to come up with a picture for the background, I tried to find a picture of Mount Zion as it would have appeared back in the Old Testament days. But people's cameras apparently weren't working too good back in those days or something because I couldn't find a picture. When you look at Mount Zion, you know what picture you always come up with? The abomination, the Dome of the Rock, the mosque that sits on the site or near the site of where the temple was years ago a perverted religion that comes from that group of people. During the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, the temple was desecrated that sat there at the time. And the Bible talks about the time in the future when the Antichrist will desecrate the temple once again, probably slaughtering a pig on the altar or some such thing. Uh, But he says eventually it's going to be purified for the nations to come unto, to see. And to understand. When they first returned from captivity, it was only the strong that returned to work. And this is the thought that's given in verses 4 and 5, where it's looking for a new day of blessing. And it talks about the old men returning to the city with the canes, which they didn't do in those days because it's only the ones that could work that went back. Uh, But it's going to be different in the future. The city conditions are going to be future or different in the future. Uh, the old people in the streets we talked about. Isaiah talks about old people too. Isaiah 65, 20 and 22. It says, no longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days. We're talking about the millennial period, by the way, in case you're not making the switch that he's making. He's taking us into the far future. He says, no longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days nor an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be thought accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. And they shall not build and another inhabit, and they shall not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so shall be the days of my people, and my chosen ones shall wear out the work of their hands." So he talks about the day when the city will be totally different and the time when children will play in the streets. There's no time. It's a time of peace. They don't have to worry about what's happening. You know, I was talking the other day to my therapist, a physical therapist, or occupational therapist, I guess she is. But anyway, we were lamenting the fact that when we were growing up, kids rode bicycles around towns. You know, they went and played with other kids. They ran around. They had pickup games. And now you're afraid to let them do it because we don't live in those times anymore. I can remember the times when uh, 
my dad, I thought, was weird because he locked or always left the, took his keys out of the car. He didn't lock the car, but he always took the keys when we went anywhere. Uh, he took them out and put them in his pocket. And everybody else, you walk down through the little town I lived, and if you looked in the windows of the cars, 95% of them had keys sitting in the ignitions while their people went around their business. You don't do that anymore. We don't go anywhere without locking our doors of our car when we get out. And we've always taken the keys out. But we're living in a different time. But we're going to back down or go back to a time when things are peaceful and we don't have to worry about those things. <laughs> One of the questions that God asks in this passage, after he tells him all these great things is going to happen to Jerusalem, he says, is that too hard for you to understand? You know, faith and belief are sometimes hard to come by. But whether we have in faith and belief is shown in the lives that we live. He promises that there's going to be a regathering, that Jews are going to be back from all corners of the earth to return to Jerusalem and to return to Palestine. And God's promise is this, they will be my people and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Zechariah is literally speaking of the Jewish people living in Palestine in the last days. It's not a reference to the church. Too many people today are trying to apply all the Jewish blessings to the church, calling the church the spiritual Israel. And it's true, we are Abraham's seed, the Bible tells us, according to the promise. But there are a lot of promises that were given to Israel, not a single promise. Uh, Ezekiel speaks of the time when God will again breathe his spirit into a people who are thought to be spiritually dead, and they will live once again. That's the nation of Israel as God's people. God will be their God, he says, in truth and in righteousness. And that's, I think, some of the fundamental keys for living today. Always seeking the truth and always striving towards righteousness in our lives. That is, living in the image of God. God then applies this promise to their lives. And it is an encouragement to live lives the way God wants them to live. His encouragement for them is to be strong. It's a reference both to courage and to being optimistic. Optimistic because the promises that he's just told them are going to come to pass. The promise of the future is what gives us courage today. You know, I often look around and I wonder, conditions being what they are in America and in the world, why people don't despair of life itself? You know what keeps me going day by day? It's the knowledge that things are going to get better. That one day the trumpet's going to sound, and we're going to rise to meet the Lord in the air if we're prepared. And things are going to be totally different than what we know now. So wonderful and great. And that's what keeps me going day by day. And that's what should drive everybody's life. But if you don't have that hope, what do you have? You get to be my age, you got another 10, 15 years, you're dead. And that's it. It's over. And your days will come too. But we have more than that because we have a hope that's been given to us by God. Uh, he says, listen to the prophets, and he's referring to himself and to Haggai and others, those of that era, that they were rebuilding the temple. There's a continual need that we have to listen to what God's word tells us in our lives. God's reasoning with them was before the temple was rebuilt, you had a difficulty making a living. The fields weren't producing enough to feed the animals or men. Man could not make a living by trading. It wasn't safe to leave the city. There's internal dangers even at home. And basically what God was saying is, you've already observed these things. You've lived them. And now what you're going to see is going to change tremendously. He says, now the earth will produce. The dew will be in abundance. Dry climate, that was necessary. He says, you're going to enjoy all this all these present blessings that you're having, and you will become now a blessing to the nations. And you 
the promise was made to Abraham, all families of the earth shall be blessed. God's promise to them was that he would not treat them as those he had to send into captivity. If, and there was requirements, if you speak only truth, if you judge by the truth, if you live in peace, and if you don't devise evil in your heart, and if you don't lie. With this promise out of the way, God takes time to fully answer their question then about fasting, coupling it with the promise of the future. He says, in the future, your fast, what does he say? He says, your fast will become joy and gladness and cheerful feast for the house of Judea. You fasted because there was a reason, true. But in the future, those fasts are going to be turned to feasts of joy. Fasts were caused because of disobedience to God's word and trying to humble ourselves before God. It says it's going to be changed when you see God's blessing and he has the future in mind. Therefore, he instructs, love truth and peace. That's the provisions upon which the future blessings rest. Truth is an important key to this whole passage. People are going to, in the future, come to Jerusalem, he says, to learn of God. From around the world, people will speak of going to the house of the Lord, and others will say, well, I will go with you. I want to go and learn too. People's desire will be to learn of God. It says many peoples and mighty nations are going to come. There's going to be a constant flow of people to Jerusalem to learn more about the Lord. Some feel that mighty nations is a reference to Muslims, and I'm not sure how they get to that point, but that's what they believe. Isaiah prophesies also of this migration of people to Mount Zion to inquire and learn of the Lord during the millennial period. In Isaiah 2, verse 3, he says, And many peoples will come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Zechariah has told us in this passage, Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from all nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. It's a complete turnaround from what the people were experiencing right then. They were a drown-trodden people. And God prophesies a change is going to come. Didn't come in their lifetime, but a change is going to come for the children of Israel. People are going to come almost falling at their feet to learn from God, from the Jewish people. Tells of the time when the Jews will have been converted. Zechariah tells of their conversion later on in Zechariah 12.10. He says, And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. So they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will be bitterly over him as the bitter weeping for a firstborn. They're going to come begging the Jews to teach him of God, and of course the Jews themselves will have to learn about the Messiah says they're going to be grasping the garment, an uh, uh, act of humble entreaty, desiring to come and learn, and learn what God has offered or has for them. The picture uh, throughout almost this whole chapter is millennial in outlook. God is telling of his bright tomorrow to give people courage and hope to cause them to lift up their hearts to him. And instead of being wrapped up in themselves and whether they required to feast or not, they should be wrapped up in serving God. Zechariah in this chapter tells us a lot about the conditions in that thousand-year reign of Christ. He tells us how all nations and peoples will make pilgrimages to Jerusalem to learn about God. And I think that is one of the best or the beautiful features of of this millennial period. Zechariah also tells us the Jews' occupation during that time period will be. While the church is going to be ruling and reigning with Christ, the Jews are going to be instructing the nations and the peoples in the ways of God. 
By the way, the distinction between Israel and church is clearly laid out in the different occupations they have during this time period. And last, it speaks of a time being a time of truth and peace, a time when people will live to a ripe old age before they die, and a time when children will be able to play in the streets without fear of danger. A day when all this comes about is going to be a glorious day. With all that in mind, God instructs the people to live today in truth and righteousness and justice. The promises of God are predicated on our dedication to God today. As we look forward to tomorrow, we must learn to live in light of the coming kingdom.